Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks for thanks for coming along. Uh, yeah, this was called Donizetti in the in the eighteen thirties, and um, I thought of a number of of ways we could do this. And initially, I thought we might we'd concentrate on those three Tudor operas, you know, on Maria, on Anna Bolena, Maria Stuarda, and Roberto de Verreur. But after a while, I thought, well, yeah, we can we can do a little bit of that. But actually, something more interesting would be to um, take a leaf out of that famous uh, radio program by the director of the British Library and do um, a history of Donizetti opera in objects, in documents. Um, and I thought I'd base it around Lucia di Lammermoor, um, mainly because Lucia di Lammermoor, well, it's Donizetti's most famous opera, but it's also an opera which I've been working on for the last um, 20 or so years, an embarrassingly long time. I've been preparing a critical edition of it. Um, the first version of this critical edition was, was premiered at the Royal Opera House in uh, 2003, so nearly 20 years ago now. And the final version of it um, was, um, was going to be done at La Scala in 2020. Well, we all know what happened to that. It was gonna open the season at La Scala uh, uh, this, um, this last year but of course was, was canceled. It'll come back there some other time. So anyway, I thought I'd um, sort of look at Donizetti's world through these documents um, in the 1830s and, and see if we can have some kind of idea about um, what the material culture of the time was. The San Carlo, this was uh, Lucia di Lamour was, uh, was premiered in Naples and the Naples theater at that time were um, run by a bunch of aristocrats um, who were by all accounts, totally incompetent. I mean, even by the standards of modern politicians, uh, these guys were, were something special. They didn't really know what they were doing. Um, and the logistical problems of, of running theatres at that time were extreme, particularly because you had um, no idea of what the schedule was going to be. Um, if an opera was successful, it would just continue on and on and on, being performed endlessly. Uh, while if no one liked it, it would come off after the first night and something else would have to be put on stage. So it was an extraordinarily difficult logistical exercise um, and it was very difficult to compel people to even turn up uh, to the to the theatre. The singers often just didn't turn up, and others had to be found and everything. Anyway, this this one completely fell apart um, during the summer. Um, Lucia di Lammermoor was supposed to be first performed in July. Donizetti had turned up in Naples uh, in April. So three months early, which for him was quite a, a decent amount of time. But in the end, there were terrible delays through the summer and the thing didn't get performed uh, until the end of September. So he arrives in, uh, he arrives in, uh, in Naples in April and, um, you know, you think, well, that's three months. That's not a bad amount of time. But actually, um, he didn't even... Uh, have the subject by that time. He didn't even know what opera he was going to be writing. He had absolutely no idea. He didn't know who the librettist would be. He could have ended up writing anything at that time. And it wasn't until June that he started getting the libretto together. And um, in the end, he wrote the opera in about uh, four weeks. Uh, which for him was actually quite a long time in some ways. It's very, um, it might be a surprise to you, but these things were done at extreme speed. So um, let's have a look at the first document that I asked you to have a look at. Uh, and we're going to share the screen now. And if, yeah, if you could just bring it up a bit, uh, the, the beginning of the document we can see. Now, what is this, uh, this first document? It looks like um, a kind of plot synopsis. And that's exactly what it is. It says, for parte prima, first 
first part, um, the first act, and then it says introduzione e cavatina di Ashton. In other words, it's laying out what the first number is going to be. So this was the very first stage of um, making the libretto, if you want, and it's a kind of plot synopsis. So what's the reason for this? Why did they need to have a plot synopsis first off? Well, there are two main reasons. One is that um, you see when it says introduzione e cavatina here, that what the plot synopsis does is break down the play on which the libretto is based, breaks it down into musical numbers so that everyone knows where they are and the librettist can then form the verses of the libretto based on what he knows the musical structure is going to be. So that was one reason to, to sort of lay out the musical structure in that way. But another reason, and it's a very important one, was to give an account of the plot to make sure that the local censorship did not object to anything in it. For instance, if a, if a king was going to be killed or something like that, then it would immediately be banned and so on. So this um, uh, basic plot synopsis was a way of clearing the censors, uh, the state censorship out of the equation so they knew they could go on. So that's the first document, if you want, that is the beginning of Lucia di Lammermoor. Let's have a look at the next one next document. Now we'll leave that, I don't want to expand that up because I want to make it look as illegible as possible. Um, uh, what this is, is um, a page of sketches by Donizetti. I don't actually think any of these sketches are of Lucia di Lammermoor, um, but they could be because they are enormously difficult. To read. And the interesting thing about them, as you can see even from uh, this distance, <coughs> is that most of the musical sketches um, don't have any words attached to them. In other words, what Donizetti, he's got some words down at the bottom there, but they're obviously in a sort of separate place, but most of the musical sketches are without words. They're just of simple melodic lines. And my guess is that when Donizetti first starts thinking about the music of Lucia, he's actually thinking about it on the basis of this plot synopsis that you saw before. So in other words, he's writing vague melodies um, or which may be loosely connected with the kind of drama that he imagines is gonna happen. Um, this makes them enormously difficult to identify. And in fact, there are huge numbers of Donizetti sketches, which no one, including me, has looked at seriously. I've, I've, been, I've been examining them a bit recently, um, partly because things turn up in these sketches that people think are operatic sketches, but are often something entirely different because they're so confused, they're so difficult to look at very often um, people have just ignored them. In, in the past few weeks, I've, uh, I've been working on Donizetti's songs, actually, his solo songs, and looking in all these sketch pages, um, I found about three examples of songs which are buried in the middle of these sketches, complete songs which are completely unknown because no one's, everyone just said, oh God, what a mess this is, and turned over and looked at something else. So they're very, very interesting, these sketches, enormously difficult to understand. Okay, the next document, document number three, is an interesting one. And what I want to look at is actually the bottom of the bottom of the page. And this is a um, this is by a guy called uh, Guillaume Cotrao. He was French, but he spent a lot of time in Italy. And uh, he was a publisher in, uh, in Naples at the time when Donizetti wrote, was writing those sketches, was writing the beginnings, the very first beginnings of Lucia di Lammermoor. And he says in this footnote at the bottom, he said, at this period, Donizetti lived on Rue Corsea, um, at the, the crossroads in Naples. And it's very probable that a, a, a big part of uh, Lucia di Lammermoor was composed in that house. 
but the other part uh, was composed in the vi, uh, Villa Maio in Infrascata, which is a place of, he says, a place of villeggiatura outside Naples, um, where he wrote a lot of the rest of it. So you can imagine Donizetti writing Lucia di Lammermoor in two different places, once in this rather cramped house in Naples, but then sometimes being invited out into the country. And it's sort of interesting to think about those two very different um, kind of um, two very different kinds of uh, atmospheres in which he was writing. You know, one might want to think that he the outdoor scenes were composed when he was outdoors and so on. It probably isn't like that. If we can go to the top of the page um, now, this is a, a chapter by, of memoirs by this publisher. And the interesting thing here is it's what this chapter is going to be about. He says it's going to be about Lucia di Lammermoor, then it's going to, going to be about Cousari and team and about some little chit chat, a lot of the books full of that. And then this big event, the death of Bellini. Now, um, it's one of the things about Lucia di Lammermoor, which, uh, which made it, I think, such a kind of critical moment was it was it was premiered in on the 25th of September, on the 23rd of September, Bellini died in Paris. And that was considered a kind of incredible and important watershed. Of course, news of Bellini's death didn't reach Naples by the time Lucia was premiered, but pretty soon afterwards it did. Um, and that gave a sort of peculiar moment to the history of Italian opera. And it may be no accident that Lucia ended up to be such a mythic opera in some ways. I mean, the music's wonderful, but also this connection with the death of Bellini and people realizing that a new episode in Italian opera was, was going to begin is an interesting, uh, interesting conjunction, if you want. Okay, that was written um, in 18... 80s and the fact that this person in the 1880s is telling us about the history of Lucia in those ways is interesting shows what a mythic um, opera it had become. Okay the next piece the next document and if we can kind of zoom in at the beginning of this document um, now what kind of document is this? Um, this is an interesting one. It's um, <clears throat> it's a stage in Lucia di Lammermoor, and uh, those of you who know the opera well um, will know that it's actually the final scene. It's um, Edgardo's uh, final aria uh, where he commits suicide at the end, and it's in Donizetti's hand. It's an autograph. Um, but what is it? Um, you see at the beginning it has it has a bass part and then what it says is um, it's a number there. I think the number is 27 and, and what that means is that okay the, the piece starts with a long orchestral introduction. There's the first bar of the orchestral introduction and then there are 27 bars rest and then the singer starts and the singer's part is written out in full, but most of the rest of the score is not written at all. So what is this? It's a very important moment, actually, in the composition of an opera. Uh, what Donny said he had to do, he didn't just sit down on page one of the orchestral score and write out the whole opera from beginning to end. That wouldn't have made sense in this period, wouldn't have... Um, uh, it wouldn't have been practical to do that. And for a very simple reason, there are huge time pressures here, as we've said already. So one of the very first things that had to happen is that the singers had to have their parts because the singers had to memorize what they were going to sing. And that took time. So the very first thing that Donizetti had to write was not an orchestral score, but this kind of partial vocal score. He may be, when he wrote this and, and gave it to the singer to learn, he may well not have worked out exactly what was going to be in the orchestration. In fact, he probably hadn't. But it's an interesting thing to think about this, that um, <clears throat> the opera was obviously composed in different layers. 
And the first layer, as we saw with those random sketches, then a libretto would be delivered to him, then he would write the vocal lines. Um, only much later on would he get to the orchestration. So it's an interesting document here, and mostly these don't survive these documents. This one does for some reason. Mostly they were given to the singers and the singers use them uh, to learn their parts and then dispense with them. And actually, if we compare this, uh, we're not going to do that now, but this doesn't actually, um, there's all sorts of details which Tony said he decided to change later. So these aren't sort of permanent things usually, and they were often discarded. For some reason, this one was retained by the singer. It was Gilbert Louis Dupre and ended up in the Bibliothèque Nationale, which is why we've had a chance to, to look at it now. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Now, what's this? Uh, this is the title page of Lucia di Lammermoor, Donizetti's autograph score. So this is the final orchestral version that he wrote. And you see he's written Lucia di Lammermoor and he spelt Lammermoor wrong there with a single M. That's not unusual. He continued to spell in a really quite strange way. And he's written on the top there, Originale, that's his writing. But in the middle here, what we've highlighted here is something completely different. Um, it says number 110, the Ministero d'Agricultura, Industria e Commercio. And uh, it's a, a royal decree from 29th of, um, 29th of July um, in 1865. Um, so what on earth is this all about? What's this being stamped? Uh, what's this to do with? It's very interesting, this. Um, this is basically a copyright notice. And the copyright notice is 1865, 1866. In other words, that's the moment of the consolidation of the Italian national state. Um, it's when Venice came into uh, to the state of Italy. And at that point, nationally, they began to have a copyright system. And this was a, a way of copywriting this school and making it uh, owned by someone. But before that time, copyright simply didn't exist uh, in Italy. And that has all sorts of ramifications, actually, for how the opera um, got developed. Anyway, this is Donizetti's orchestral score, his uh, autograph score, and um, he, um, it's a, 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 a document um, which is the basis of all future scores of the opera, so it's the basis of the music that we hear these days. Um, but it was written at extreme speed, and has all sorts of strange things in it. So let's have a look at the next slide. This is a little bit from, uh, from the orchestral score of Lucia di Lammermoor. And it's a particularly interesting moment for me. This is, the, this is during the um, Cavatina uh, of Lucia in Act One. It's Regnava del Silenzio, her first aria and this is about the blood uh, she she imagines the fountain flowing with blood she has this terrible dream you know a premonition of what's going to happen and uh, this is a little bit of it here that's written um but then you see that there are four bars um that are completely well developed uh, orchestrated and everything but then crossed out um now, as it happens, um, I can't play them to you, these bars, um, but they're very interesting and very beautiful. They're a little sort of interruption. The first two bars that are crossed out are a little sort of harmonic interruption of the aria. And then you've got a wonderful kind of um, fioritura, a wonderful ornamental passage in the second two bars, which is obviously word painting of the idea of the blood flowing uh 
uh, from the um, from the fountain. But then they got crossed out, so they never appeared in any score that we know. Um, what's an editor to do with something like this? I think you could, I mean, a, an, an obvious way of thinking about it was that, um, okay, Donizetti crossed this out. I mean, I think it's probably Donizetti who crossed this out. Um, therefore, he didn't want it anymore. Therefore, we should leave it out. But there are complications with that. Um, one of them is that uh, in all sorts of ways, because of the speed at which things were working in rehearsals, um, very often we find that Donizetti is crossing out whole areas of his scores, which he then wants to um, re reintegrate later on if he gets the chance. Um, it could be, for example, that in this case, uh, probably, I think, I don't think he cut this for what we might call musical reasons at all. It was probably something to do with the singer. Um, the singer may have had difficulty, perhaps the singer was tired, perhaps the singer simply couldn't um, sing this bit in tune because it's actually rather complicated harmonically. Perhaps she couldn't understand it. So he said, okay, we'll cross it out. Does that mean that we all have to never hear this piece? Um, in perpetuity because he decided to put a line through it. Under normal circumstances, we might want to do that. But in this case, I thought the music was so interesting that um, what I did in this latest version of the score, which um, Riccardo Chailly was going to perform at La Scala uh, at the beginning of this year, um, I talked to him about it and I said, there, there, there are three or four pieces in the score which are like this. Well, what do you think? Should we reinstate them and see what they're like? And he's incredibly in favour of doing that. So he said, yeah, yeah, put them all in and we'll do them. So actually, if this opera had been performed at La Scala, opening the season in on the 7th of December, these four bars would have been heard for the first time ever probably. Uh, and it's an interesting point whether um, we should do this. I, I wouldn't dream of putting these four bars um, directly into the critical edition and saying everyone must perform them from now on. But on the other hand, it seems a shame <clears throat> if they're interesting bars, which I think they are, just to completely ignore them. Okay, I think there's another moment from the score, from the autograph score, um, and I want to concentrate on the middle of the page here. That's right, there's uh, the middle of the page here. This is Lucia's um, mad scene in act three. And this is the um, Donizetti's orchestral school. And you can see what happens. There's a, there's a, a note here. Uh, there's a passage which is um, crossed out, crossed through rather sort of, I don't know, it, and not very definitely crossed through, crossed through in a kind of reluctant way. And on the left hand side there, it says armonico. Um, now, this was a part that Donizetti wrote um, for the mad scene of Lucia, which was using a glass harmonica. Um, but um, at a very late stage of the orchestral score, he crossed it through. And what he did, um, is substitute a solo flute instead. And if we go, if we scroll up the page a little bit uh, from where from where we are, keep going, keep going, keep going, just there um, below the, the first three lines are two violins and a viola and below that is a flute. And you can see what's written in here in very sort of faint hand is a solo flute. So the solo flute substituted for the glass harmonica. Now, again, as it happens, we know something about this. Um, the glass harmonica player um, in Naples had played a, a few shows and was making a good trade. Uh, but then he got into litigation with uh, the theatre. He, he wanted to be paid for rehearsals and they refused, re refused to pay him. And there was a huge court case about it. Luckily, there was a court case because we know then that he was in litigation. So the reason that Donizetti crossed out the glass harmonica was not because he didn't like it, was because the guy had picked up his glass harmonica and cleared off and left the theatre. 
So he had to substitute the flu. Now, we happen to know that in this case. So therefore, it seemed to me that it was a kind of no-brainer, really, to put the glass harmonica back into the edition I was doing. And indeed, ever since 2003, it's been performed with the glass harmonica, which I think is, I don't know how many of you have heard it, but it's a it's an amazing experience actually to hear it with the glass harmonica because it feels like the entire theater is kind of reverberating with this strange sound. Okay, let's carry on. Next, uh, next is, that's the instrument, that's the glass harmonica. There are various versions of the glass harmonica, some which you can play with a keyboard and some which you just wet your fingers and play. This is the, uh, the one that was used probably in the first performance. Okay, let's, um, let's go on. Okay, this is the next kind of material feature, if you want, uh, of um, the opera's dissemination. This is a copyist score. It's at the beginning, it's just the first number. Um, and this is how the opera got around, basically, how the orchestral score got disseminated to other theatres. And um, this is the, the, the musical basis of these copies, was mostly what was heard in other theatres. I think one of the interesting things, and you can see it even from this first page, is that copyists thought their job was to copy the notes. Um, they virtually didn't bother with anything else. So there are hardly any slurs, there are hardly any dynamic marks, there are huge mistakes all, all over most copyist scores. They, they, they did this at huge speed. So the way that the opera got disseminated out was in a very unstable way, because again, these copyist scores then themselves got copied. Um, so new mistakes got introduced and so on and so forth. So the, the kind of dissemination of the opera was very unstable in that way. And Donizetti constantly complains about the state of the, um, of the opera um, as it went the rounds. Okay, let's um, go on to the next one. This is another document. Uh, which comes more or less from the uh, time of the first performance. And that, as you see, is a printed libretto. Um, the first thing that's been printed out of this opera is its libretto. Um, and it's done in a rather grand way here, attached to the particular performance. Um, there are huge numbers of these libretti and practically in the early days of Lucia di Lammermoor, whenever the opera was performed in a new city, the one thing you can be sure of is that there'll be a new libretto printed, usually copied from this first one. Um, why is that? Why were these libretti all over the place? Um, why did people want these things? Well, the fact is that it, and in, 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 in an opera in the 1830s, um, you were not sitting in a darkened auditorium, you were sitting with, with the lights, um, dim lights, but still the lights were on. And many, many people, the usual thing to do in the theatre of that time was if you went to the opera, you would follow the opera in your libretto. So you would be reading along with the score. It's interesting in that sense, because the number of people that complain bitterly now about surtitles saying how dreadful they are and um, they introduce a kind of verbal immediacy that we're not, we're, we're, we're not used to. Well, that is one way of thinking about it, but actually having surtitles is in, in another sense, very similar to the way that 19th century uh, audiences were consuming this kind of music. They were reading along and they had that kind of verbal immediacy. So, okay, that's a, a libretto would probably would have the first libretto, which many of the audience would have bought a copy of this libretto and be reading it when the opera was first performed. Okay, next slide. This is the next stage in uh, the opera. And we, we need to go down a bit, actually, because it's, uh, sorry, that, yeah, that's right. That's what we want. Um, this is, um, this is a review of the first performance and um it's kind of 
it, it's in a, um, a, a Boulogne's um, theatrical journal. But one of the things that's happening in the 1830s is that journalism is beginning to take an active part in opera. And um, you get more and more theatrical journals and more and more reviews of the operas. This one's very bland. It says there's a, there's a new opera by Donizetti, Lucia di Lammermoor. It could not have achieved better applause um, and uh, because it has uh, novità di pensieri, it has new thoughts and excellence of instrumentation and made a grand effect. And the composer was called out onto the stage continually interrupting the representation. It's quite usual at the time that at the end of each number, the audience would applaud. And if they applauded a lot, then the composer who was sort of lurking somewhere nearby would come up and take a bow at the end uh, of each number. And he says the pieces that had the best, um, that pleased the most were um, Grandios Finale, that's the finale of Act Two, wonderful Cavatina, opening aria for the Prima Donna, who was Fanny Tacchinardi Persiani, a delicious duet, a love duet with her and Dupre at the end of Act One, and then the two solo scenes at the end of Act Three. First of all, a solo scene for Lucia, and then a solo scene for the tenor. Um, and it's interesting that. Um, even in that very first performance, uh, it looks like the most famous numbers in the opera had already been identified. Uh, and that's fairly unusual. I think, I mean, the one thing that needs to be said about these reviews is that um, uh, they're highly unreliable. Um, the, the reviews of Lucia actually all seem to agree with each other more or less, but sometimes you get completely different um, reports of the first performance in reviews. And one of the reasons for this was simply that um, these um, early uh, theatrical journals um, simply um, printed anything that was given to them uh, if, if people, the usual way um, it, with these theatrical journals was if you wanted to write a review and publish it in the theatrical journal, they would publish it, but instead of them paying you for the review, you had to pay them to put it in the newspaper. So sometimes you get people who hated one composer and loved another and they'd say the opera was wretched and everyone hated it, while someone else who loved the composer would say, oh, the opera was wonderful and everyone loved it. So we can't rely too much on these reviews, but they're the beginning, they're the very first example of kind of discourse, if you want, about the opera. Um, this, I think, was the very first review of Lucia ever published. How many reviews of Lucia have been published since 1835? Quite a few. This was the first one. Okay, let's, um, let's go on. Now the next uh, stage, or a next stage in the opera, which is a very important one, is this. This is the uh, Riduzione per canto e pianoforte, it's the vocal score, first published example of the music. This is published by Ricordi, um, and uh, it's a very important document. It's not an important document. Vocal scores of this uh, period were not an important document as far as theatres are concerned. No one used the vocal score in the theatre, it was just a piano accompaniment. They had other means of doing that, but it was very important for the domestic market. So often the versions of operas that you get in vocal schools are sometimes quite different from uh, the one that you found in the orchestral school. In this case with Lucia, um, several of the numbers, it's a very demanding opera for the prima donna, so several of the numbers are transposed down. Um, and that's perfectly okay for a vocal school, but Donizetti, we'll see this a bit later, hated the idea of people transposing in the theatre because it changed the way the instruments sounded, but he didn't mind if people did it at home when they were wanted to wanted to sing it. So the vocal score, um, an important document, but really one that's concerned with the kind of domestic dissemination of the opera. Okay, let's uh, go on to the next one. Now this is a 
very strange and unusual document. This is written by the librettist Camerano, uh, Salvadore Camerano. And what it is, is an account of the staging of the opera. Um, and it's not, it's an account of the way that the opera was first staged in Naples, that he was writing to send to some people who wanted to revive the opera somewhere else. And it's very interesting um, to see this because it, it's actually a five page document, it's very sparse, and it says nothing interesting or hardly anything interesting about how the opera was staged from our point of view. Um, what it says is which side the character should come in, in from, when the chorus should leave, when they should come on the stage. Um, it's very, very basic like that. Um, and it says nothing about what the characters should do when they're on stage, because that wasn't the business of the stage director. The stage director was just really directing traffic around the stage. Um, the only thing that Camerano in this account gets particularly interested in, and is almost comical, is, um, is what you might call continuity, what the film producers call continuity. So for instance, when the tenor breaks up the marriage ceremony in act two, um, he comes in, he climbs in through the window, and he's obviously come from outside, so we've got a hat and a cloak on, uh, but you can't act in a hat. So he has to take his hat off and put it down. So, so Camerano says at a certain point, he says, he takes his hat off and puts it on a chair. Now, but at the end of the act, you know, when he's cursed everyone, he's sort of chased off the stage. So Camerano says, he doesn't have time to pick up his hat. Okay, now why is that important? Because then when he comes in in the third act, he's got to be wearing a different hat. It's that sort of level of detail that this is about. This is the level of staging. It's just basic continuity which goes on. Clearly what happened on stage in this first performance is people came on, they sang, they gestured a bit, they went off again. And that's more or less all they did. Another thing which is interesting is clear, not, not from this document, from the others we've seen, if the chorus came on, there's always music to accompany the chorus on and off. And it was expected that the chorus would move all in step together in time with the music. Just imagine, I mean, that looks more like, you know, Oklahoma than it does Lucia di Lammermoor, okay, with the chorus all coming in uh, together um, like that, but that's what they did. Nothing, let me warn you, whatever strangeness you see on the operatic stage uh, at the next production you watch of Lucia di Lammermoor, nothing would be as strange as watching the first performance, the level of acting or non-acting that was going on, the kind of gestures that people were made would be utterly, utterly um, alienating for us now. So whenever you complain about modern productions, fine, um, but don't assume that um, the original production would have been something to your taste. It's very unlikely. Okay, let's, um, let's go on. Now this is, um, we're going a little bit later in the, um, in the story of Lucia di Lammermoor. Lucia di Lammermoor was first performed, it got performed all over Italy, um, but then something very important for Donizetti was to pre prepare it for the Parisian stage. And he did this in a number of ways. First of all, the Italian version of Lucia di Lammermoor was performed at the Théâtre Italien in Paris, one of Paris's great theatres, um, and the international centre for opera, where Donizetti, of course, ended up at the end of this decade. So he wanted to perform Lucia at the Teatro Italien in Italian. But the other thing that he did, and he spent a lot of time doing, was actually making a French language version, Lucie de Lamour. And he did this with a couple of his operas. He did it with um, Lucrezia Borgia, and he, he wanted to do it with several others of his operas. Now, why did he do this? It's interesting, this letter, he's saying, he's writing this letter in French, um, 
to collaborators and he's saying uh the the, the people who are working on this French Lucie de la Maman with him. And he says the, um, the new recitatives are in the are with the copyist, and I've added here or there some notes to make the words uh, go better with the music. And he also says that the uh, the duet at the end of Act One, uh, it's fine to transpose it. We mentioned this earlier, it's fine to transpose it, but make sure no one transposes it in the theatre. So this is an example of him working on this Lucie de Lamamour. Now, why did he give such attention to a French language opera, French language version of the opera, even to the extent of rewriting the recitatives, as you can see? Well, the reason was a money one. Um, when he went to Paris, um, he got his operas performed there and he received a certain amount of money from the main Parisian theatres. But as he said in letters, it was damn expensive to live in Paris. And a lot of them, and he had to stay there because they rehearsed the operas, unlike in Italy, they rehearsed the operas for months on end. And he had to stay in Paris all that time. It cost him a lot of money. So um, he, did, he sort of broke even. He did okay on that. But where you really made money in Paris, because Paris was protected by copyright, unlike Italy. So where he made the most money out of Lucia di Lammermoor was not when it went all around the world. He hardly earned anything from that. But when it toured the French provinces in French, because the provinces didn't want operas in foreign languages so but when it when it went the rounds of the French provinces it was under copyright protection and he earned a huge amount of money from it so that's why he spent all this time on the Parisian version interestingly if there's one thing we all know about the uh, Parisian version that it was performed uh, in Rouen um, uh, at a certain point, uh, because it forms a scene of Flaubert's Madame Bovary, wonderful scene where Madame Bovary, it's a kind of critical scene in the novel where she imagines that she's the tenor and has this elaborate fantasy about running away with him, is the kind of beginning, or one of the beginnings or a stage in her downfall. So, okay, that's Lucie de Lamamore. And I think the next one there, there's the vocal score. A vocal score was done of Lucie de Lamamore. And you see it there. And there's a beautiful sort of picture there of him, of, of the love duet at the end of Act One, which is becoming an iconic piece here, um, particularly when they sing in octaves at the end. And you can see they've both got the same gesture. So they're obviously singing that moment together. And you see he's got those tremendous boots on. Um, one of the things that uh, Madame Bovary um, and Flaubert goes on about are the boots that the tenor wore in this provincial performance. Okay, let's go to the next uh, one. Now, this is an interesting one. This is a collection de mise en scène uh, published by Pagliante and it's a production book for uh, Lucie de Lamamore. In France, as opposed to in Italy, they took the staging much more seriously. And this is a, a substantial pamphlet, not just those tiny couple of pages that um, the Camerano wrote about where to put your hat. This is something much more elaborate. And it's the beginning, I think, in a sense, of the, of this period in the 1830s is the beginning of kind of modern staging. And just at the bottom, there's a particular moment that I want to draw your attention to. And this is describing the first, um, the baritone's aria at the beginning of the opera. And it says, Aston continue à parcourir scène. It's a very important moment there. So what are you saying? Pendant il chante l'allegro. So while he's singing the aria, Ashton, the baritone, continues to walk around the stage, right? The front of the stage. Now that's the beginning of something quite radical because it, before that time, singers had not moved when they were singing their arias. Their business was to sing. So they sat there, they stood there 
and they did the odd gesture, um, but that was it. But this is insisting that Ashton, the uh, the uh, um, Enrico, is very he's very angry at this moment. He's very very angry, and he demonstrates his anger by walking around while he's singing. That's the kind of detail, staging detail, which in the event, which eventually flowers into the system that we're in at the moment where staging has become an extremely important aspect of production. Okay, let's go to the next one. Now this um, is in 1847 and uh, Donizetti, uh, this is some uh, a review, a, a memoirs from 1847 um, and Donizetti um, is in an asylum by this stage in 1845 he succumbed to syphilis paralysis and he's stuck in an asylum and the reason I, I wanted to draw your attention to this is the way in which Lucia de Lammermoor by that stage only 12 years after it was first performed has become iconic in some way so um, I'm sure this is completely fabricated by the way this account but it's significant uh, um, because what they chose to fabricate was this. So his, his madness was gentle, silent, stretched out on a great sofa in the middle of a garden, covered with flowers all over him and all around him at his feet. His head was fixed on his chest and he passed his days without pronouncing a single word. Didn't recognize anyone, not even his friend, uh, Michele Accursi, who didn't abandon him and looked after him with uh, an incredible devotion. They tried several musical experiences on Donizetti, but he remained, though they remained without success. One piece, only one piece, the mad scene from Lucia di Lammermoor produced some impression on him. At the first chords, he raised his head, he opened his eyes, he began to beat time. And then when the cavatina was finished, his eyes closed, his head fell back on his chest and all spark of intelligence disappeared from him. I'm sure made up. I mean, it reads like a novel doesn't it? Um, but what is significant is the extent to which Lucia di Lammermoor is becoming iconic and becoming in some way associated with the mad scene and the mad scene associated with the fact that Donizetti ended in an asylum. Okay, next, uh, next slide. Now I want to concentrate on a particular bit on the right hand corner here. Um, this little bit, this little cadenza here, which goes bum, bee, 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 bum, 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 That is the cadenza at the end of the mad scene. And uh, you can see just at the top there, um, just beyond the page is the glass harmonica part still crossed out. This is the famous cadenza. Um, and that's what it was when Donny said he wrote it. One would assume um, that, um, probably the singer would have elaborated it a little bit more. Um, uh, certainly that's just an arpeggio and the singer would have done something more. But as the mad scene became more and more iconic and more and more associated with Donizetti and associated with opera more generally, the mad scene began to, grow, the cadenza of the mad scene began to grow and grow and grow. And if we go to the next, um, uh, the next slide, we'll see uh, someone you, most of you probably recognize, and that's uh, Australian soprano Nellie Melba. And in uh, about 1875, or perhaps 1878, she, at the beginning of her career, she began to sing Lucia a lot. And her teacher, Matilda Marchese, wrote for her an elaborate mad scene with the flute, you all know it because it's still the mad scene that everyone more or less sings today. Um, it was written in the 1870s. It bears nothing, no relationship to um, anything Donizetti would have written at that time. It's a feature uh, of um, the late 19th century 
made iconic by Nellie Melba, but then in this curious alchemy which happens with opera, then became a fixed part of the opera and has uh, remained with it ever since. Um, okay, next uh, slide. This is a wonderful little um, uh, example there. In, it comes from, as you see, March 1941, and then after 1941 is, um, is X, uh, 1X is, is 19. Uh, why it's 19 is because um, with, this is during the fascist period in Italy, and 1941 was the 19th fascist year, if you want. And during that year, a magnificent facsimile of the autograph of Lucia di Lammermoor was uh, was produced. Um, and this is the kind of um, preface to it. And it says the Senator Giovanni Treccani da Fieri, who owned the the um, the uh, the autograph at that point, um, he says, has wanted with a munificent gesture to assure to Italy evading its exportation, uh, uh, the assure to Italy, the autograph score of Lucia di Lammermoor. So in other words, he published this elaborate facsimile in order to ensure that the autograph would stay in Italy. In other words, everyone would know where it was and that it couldn't be exported out. And he says elsewhere, he didn't want the Americans to get their hands on it. Why I'm showing you this is partly because it shows how iconic Lucia has become. A facsimile of the autograph is released at that time. But it also um, shows how opera, Italian opera, particularly Donizetti and particularly Verdi, was appropriated by the fascists um, and used as national material in some way. And a lot of the stories about Verdi as a political composer come from this period where uh, national monuments are needed to be shored up in a very um, complex world. Okay, and the last slide, 21, is the critical edition. As you see, it's edited by my friend Gabriele Dotto and, uh, and me, and um, it's going to be published in about uh, two months' time now. It's uh, finally reached the light of day after being performed uh, for all this time. So you can see, um, okay, that's, that's, that's it with the slides. Thanks very much, uh, Zach. You can see from those, there's something about the, the kind of material history, if you want, of the opera. Um, I've got a, a, a couple of seconds just to talk about um, the, those three operas that if, if you wanted to know something about how Donizetti um, progressed in the 1830s and something of the variety of what he was producing. I think one of the most interesting ways of doing that is to look at the final scenes of three so-called Tudor operas, um, Anna Bolena in 1830, Maria Stuarda in, 18, in 1835, and Roberto de Verreux in 1837. And you can see something about his, his development um, as a um, as a composer through those three um, through those three scenes and in some ways you can see it as a kind of emancipation away from Rossini. Anna Bolena still has that kind of vocal extravagance ornamentation that you hear a lot in Rossini and one of the great problems of the 1830s for Bellini as well as Donizetti was trying to kind of extricate himself from this enormously powerful force. And then Maria Stuarda um, is a huge outpouring of, of passionate melody. So, the same year as Lucia di Lammermoor is the kind of center of Donizetti as an Italian composer. And by, the eight, by 1837 on Roberto de Verreux, what you're seeing is increasingly complex harmonic 
fragmentary language, really Donizetti sort of drawing away, if you want, from the Italian tradition or beginning to draw away from it and thinking about Parisian opera and Paris as the place that he wants to spend the rest of his career. So in a sense, you can see those three scenes as charting Donizetti's progress through, through the 1830s. Um, okay, um, look, I'll stop there. Um, if anyone's, uh, an hour is quite long enough to talk. If anyone's got any questions or comments, I'm happy to hear them. Um, Roger, I think I'll, I'll start us off. Um, as you said in your essay about the, the Tudor uh, queens, uh, the, the Tudor stories served as a moral of sorts about absolute power and corruption. H how did the 1830 Italians, you know, as Donizetti is going on this kind of progression as well, how are they reacting to these operas as they're being premiered? Yeah, it's very interesting. I think that the business of everyone, um, you know, talks about this, how Donizetti was so interested in Tudor England. And very often the English take this as a compliment to themselves. Oh, you know, how wonderful that English history is, is so, you know, is, is so, um, uh, so famous that people want to write operas about it. Um, in fact, in all sorts of ways, as I said in that program book, um, the, the situation was quite different in some ways. Um, Tudor England was thought of as a, a place of nasty absolute power, um, where kings could simply dictate what happened uh, with no democratic accountability. And um, they were, um, these are sort of horror stories really you know, of what happens when you have absolute power. And it's interesting in Italy because we're, st we're in a very unstable position in Italy at the moment, there are revolutions. There's thought, active thought going into what kind of government do we want? Um, do we, what kind of control uh, should society be under? And it's interesting that in a sense, while there's a lot of state censorship going on, Italian opera was one of the places where those kind of those kind of questions could get explored in some way. What are the you know what happens when people um, are given absolute power? And the answer is in in Donizetti's operas when people are given absolute power, something nasty almost always happens to them. They 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 get in increasing. Um, uh, bad relationship between their personal lives and their political lives, and they're destroyed more or less by this position of power. So it's a kind of they're they're in in some ways not a celebration of England or Britain in any sense, but a kind of a kind of warning about what can happen if you indulge in absolutism. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting in that way. Uh, a very quick observation, if I may, is a fascinating uh, story you've told us about Lucio, and I was particularly struck by your uh, comment about everybody following uh, on uh, uh, with the libretto actually during the performance, and your the way you related that to Sir titles today. Um, when I started out as a very lowly assistant director at ENO, the idea of Sir titles were an absolute abomination because we told ourselves at the time that um, composers like Verdi or Wagner would have been totally committed to the idea of their operas being performed in the language that their audience, uh, wherever they were, would understand, i.e. The, the, the local language. How committed or not do you think Donizetti was to that? Did he care whether an opera was given in Italian to a French or a German audience, or was he very, um, was he very keen that it should be in a language which the audience could understand? No, I don't, I did quite honestly, I don't think he cared one way or the other. I mean, if there's a libretto there, you know, so you can, you can follow it, um, then that seemed to be quite sensible. I mean, I think, I, I think the, where things change 
as so often with this is Wagner in some ways. I mean, Wagner, you know, there's no action of Wagner wanted a darkened auditorium. And the one thing with a darkened auditorium is you can't read your libretto anymore and you have to concentrate on the stage. But it's interesting with Wagner in that sense, and some people have said this, that what Wagner has to, in a sense, substitute for that reading of the libretto is this elaborate system of light motifs. So everyone knows when someone says my sword and you get the sword motive so so that you know what he's talking about. And so you get that semantic immediacy is substituted in some ways by um, by the musical. I mean, the music tells you much more about it. I don't know with Verdi, um, Donizetti, um, very often, I mean, it's slightly changed by the time you get to Verdi. With Donizetti, Italian opera was performed in Italian in most places, okay? It, you know, if you went to hear the Italian opera in London, it was called the Royal Italian Opera, and they performed in Italian. They performed German operas and French operas in Italian as well. You know, that was the language in which you performed opera. It was only in the French provinces, I think, that you got this different way of thinking about it. So norm, the normal situation worldwide of Italian opera was for people not to be able to understand what was going on. But they had their libretti, their libretti, often with dual languages, so they could read it. So I think, I mean, it's interesting, those debates about surtitles very often seem to rely on some idea of historical reality, which actually didn't make any historical sense at all. But interesting, yeah. Well, great. Well, Roger, I just want to thank you so much uh, for putting this uh, evening together and uh, sharing these insights with us. I know that I've, I've personally really enjoyed learning this way. Roger, thank you. And uh, we hope to see Pleasure. everyone again soon. Okay.